You're listening to The Business Communicators. For more than 20 years, our next guest has been transforming business from within, elevating the talents of organizations to a new performance level, and her experience has taught her to put tremendous value on people, which I think is incredibly important. I think that's something that we all agree with here on this podcast. So we're excited to welcome Deb Coviella. Deb, thanks for joining us on The Business Communicators for the last episode of 2021. Oh, it is my pleasure. And hopefully I can make a contribution to an already fantastic podcast. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Well, we're excited to have you. And in, speaking of contributions, you know, one of our former contributors to the podcast, Mark Morrison, he joined us on season three. He was actually in Minnesota this week doing a photography shoot for Parade Magazine, uh, working with the Team USA curling team. And as I understand, you are somewhat of a curling expert as well. Tell us about it. I mean, what what is it like <sighs> being on the ice? How did you get involved in what what's your takeaway for the uh, the Olympics in Beijing? Should we expect Team USA oh curling God. to get gold? <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise and sincere thank you for asking about that. So I get the great pleasure of um, throwing 42 pounds of granite on ice, which is very sli slippery, sweeping real hard and yelling at people. But mind you, it is an Olympic sport, not just a drinking sport. But oh my, you know, um, I have been curling for 13 years. Uh, my old boss said, hey, why don't you come out and curl with us? Uh, my husband and I joined. I said, oh my, I fell. I pulled every muscle. But you know what? It is one of those things, just like golf, just like bowling. It is a community. And you could be playing with anybody who's 82 down to eight years old on the same team. And it's a, a sport for a lifetime. But the Olympics, oh my, I actually knew people competing in the Olympic trials. Team Dropkin, Thomas Howland and Corey Dropkin, they've actually been at our home. My son, David, actually curled with them many, many years ago. So we were cheering for them, super excited for Schuster to make it to the um, uh, Olympics and also uh, Team Bear, Allison Howell. We know her family and her as well, rooting for her, didn't make it, but we love the sport and um, could go on and on about it. So have you guys tried it yet? <laughs> we haven't. I mean, you know, here in Texas, Thomas will tell you about the weather. So uh, it's not really conducive to <laughs> curling. But I'm sure that our listeners didn't expect, they expected to hear Thomas's dog in the background because that happens on a weekly episode. <laughs> but uh, they probably didn't expect the curling insight. So we appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is curling in Houston and Dallas. So 2022 bucket list Olympics. Give it a try. I can put you in touch with them. We'll have to bring you down for a live broadcast or something like that from, <laughs> from the ice. I was going to say, I have found the curling ring. I think it's down around Clear Lake area, but it's only for like certain hours of the week. And I'm like, Ugh, and it's always like the, the not as conducive and Houston's kind of large. So I, I have wanted to try it. I'm looking for an invite to go. So come on down and we'll go. I love it. All right. So enough of the curling talk. Maybe we'll get into that after the Olympics, but uh, Deb, you know, Communication and marketing, it, it, to me, it's all about disruption. And uh, I, I've been told, you know, from a few people, especially in the IBC community, that I've, I've, at times I've been a little bit of a disruptor. So I'm okay with that term. And when I look at the corporate world, you know, so many companies tend to take, you know, the wait and see approach, whether it's on weighing in on social issues, climate, so on and so forth. But I think it was your last podcast that you had. I really liked your you know, introduction where you said something along the lines of don't go with the flow, question the status quo. And to me, that means going all in on being a disruptor. And I think I'd like to think at least that the three of us on the podcast are disruptors. So can you kind of expand on that? On you know, not going with the flow, but creating change. Oh, thank you so much for that. And yeah, it was an amazing interview. You know, I as a child always asked why, why is the sky blue? And they said, just stop asking so many questions. And then I went into corporate and asked questions and sometimes was said, you shouldn't have said that. And so one of the things that I find is that it takes a lot of courage to ask why, ask better questions. And while corporate celebrates the subject matter experts, the people that have the answers, the people that ask better questions are the ones that get people to think differently. And then you open your mind up to possibilities. And even if met with dissension, you at least start a conversation. 
being an answer person is going to get you ahead in the short term, but it's not going to get you ahead in leadership. So I have always questioned, I want to understand the universe and the environment and the interactions. Only then could I then contribute. So it's a superpower. And sometimes it's not celebrated. I like the title of the book, uh, CEO's Compass. As you were writing this or as you were working on this, what were you thinking? What were some of your primary um, <sighs> tenets that uh, you wanted to really have stand out that people could take away from? So I so appreciate that, Hattie. You know, the CEO's Compass, your guide to get back on track. I mean, this is the book that I wish I had as I was moving up in my corporate career. I was a communicator, but I also didn't know and understand my own self personal leadership style, how to interface with people, their complex and difficult and difficult situations. And having not had a mentor or a coach along the way, it was frustrating and it's hard, but with courage, I found my way through and kept getting promoted. But then as I moved ahead, and yes, I was a subject matter expert, I said, you know, I've got all these thoughts and experience about how to get to closer to the C-suite. And what I found were so many professionals in corporate who were rock stars get stuck because they lost their confidence. There was nobody there to model the right behavior, give them the coaching and feedback that they wanted to navigate and get back into that rock star lane. And so the CEO's compass is the playbook I never had. And it is for the aspiring C-suite person that needs a compass to get back on track. And I give them first personal development uh, skills, as well as how to skills to look at the people around them, even communication skills to be able to get them back back on track. Yes, it is for the CEO who looks at their organization and says something's not right. Here are some things I can do. But my heart, my passion work is there are a lot of people who could be, be CEOs in function and may not realize it. So that's my passion. That's my, this is my why. So you mentioned starting off as a communicator and then moving into the C-suite. And, and we look at the statistics behind it that the, C, the chief marketing officer is usually the, the has the least amount of tenure on the board and the turnover is pretty high there. What are some of your stories about going from communications to the C-suite? Uh, because a lot of the C-suites end up coming from like the C, the operations background or the finance background before stepping into the executive office. Yeah, so that is a really great question. One of the things I have seen is that those people that get identified as high performers or the CEOs or COOs have the privilege and opportunity sometimes to have the coaching and mentoring an executive coach to just fine tune those skills that manifest in charisma and in communications. And society has done us a disservice. Those people that are CMOs, CFOs, they are subject matter experts. We need them to cover our back in their area of expertise. And that's how we reward them. And along the way, we miss something. We don't teach them to more effectively communicate for influence. They're really good at communicating. Here's the data and here's the trend. It, isn't it obvious what we should be doing? Um, there's no questions here, what's going on, and then they go away frustrated. One of the things that I find that is missing is we don't talk about messaging, which is a key principle in communication. You can communication one way and people just don't get it. Or you could be talking too much and not listening enough. A leader should be listening 70% of the time and only come forth with information, conclusion, and perspective 30%. We don't teach that. That's all in the book here. The other thing we don't teach them is how to put things in the language of business. Your CFO might know that, maybe your marketing person, but what about your chief technical officer, your chief information officer? What's missing is here's the information. Is it good or bad? What's the risk or opportunity to the business and the impact? I find those are two missing elements and we do a disservice to those leaders. We don't give them those additional feedback or essential tools to make them influential messengers in order to get into the C-suite. 2021, I've noticed there have been leaders and communicators, C-suite, whoever, who have been communicating all of the wrong things based on how uh, everything is transformed. How do you see these folks who are not doing as great of a job reinvent themselves? How can they transform their businesses? Also, too, because you've seen businesses fail. Check out better.com, how the CEO communicated 900, what is it? 900 people were losing their job via a Zoom. Who does that? So 
What are some of the things that you would have advised differently or better yet what people could do now moving forward to avoid this kind of disaster? <laughs> These are leaders. Again, they may have been great and gotten results, but this is a key point that differentiates leaders and great leaders. I find some of the best leaders in organizations, they get those results year in and year out. They're within budget. Their sales are up. They've got the greatest market share. But how did they get there? Because what they do is they're so focused on a result, they exude that behavior. Their people are so focused on a result and they get them. And then what happens to the month or quarter that they don't get them? They beat their people into submission in meetings and emails, and they wear their people out until they get the result they want. And the cycle of that kind of leadership and reacting to results it are result in the people that don't get the results and have to fire 900 people. The leaders that I have interviewed on my podcast, the Drop-In CEO podcast, are those that seek peace of mind. They ask a question. What is the outcome we're trying to achieve versus that short-term result? If it's, I want to be the favorite of the customer, not number one, the favorite, and ask people for their opinion, people will be creative and do the work to achieve an outcome and not be siloed and at all costs get that result, which eventually is going to result in that cycle. I think leaders need to step back and do some personal development and change their mindset in pursuit of peace of mind or just a result. Because if it's just a result, people are just going to be a transaction. If it's peace of mind, they bring their minds and creative and passion and interests. I'm kind of curious because in the last few years, we've seen that, you know, CEOs have been more active and vocal on social media and being out there. And of course, you know, the time person of the year who we'll get into in a little bit later in this episode, Elon Musk, uh, you can't take his phone away from him. Um, but, you know, we look at data from, you know, like the Edelman Trust Barometer, and it says that, you know, people want to be able to uh, understand and hear from their CEOs to take a stand on issues that matter to them. And we see even more and more throughout society that people are going to organizations that they identify with and their personal values instead of the other way around. How do you think that has kind of transformed the way leaders manage the companies and, and how they'll you know, continue to manage and, and maybe pivot a little bit more into that direction in 2022 and beyond? So I'm glad you brought that point up about leaders being more of thought leaders and putting their ideas out there versus maybe just leaving it to their marketing department to put out whatever they are supposed to do in terms of wins and new products and sustainability. It is a missed opportunity because ultimately what is the CEO or leader of a company supposed to do? It is to connect with the people. It is to connect with the community. It is to connect with consumers or clients and ultimately build trust. If you're not putting yourself out there and you don't, people don't know what you're thinking or doing or your leadership, there's always a question about what is your leadership. And just a quick story. Oh my, I'm on my podcast. I have all kinds of leaders come on my podcast. I have the ones that have the great talking points and people tell me afterwards, it's a great show, but I don't remember what they said. And then I have some people, presidents of companies, they got no social, very little, uh, not a lot of social media, but when they show up on my podcast and you hear how human centric they are about taking care of the people, doing things in the community, elevating the people first, letting them make mistakes. Those are the leaders that put themselves out there because they don't have to be in front. They'll put their thoughts out there, elevate their people. Those are the ones that I think in the long game are going to increase their market share consumer trust, um, and ultimately result in business. Leaders have to be patient for that. And I think they really need to put themselves out there and communicate more, especially in the social media space, speaking or podcasting. Earlier, you had mentioned uh, about the, the CEO who's maybe not entitled at this time or something like that. How do you go about helping identify those people in the organization? And how do you help them craft the message for as a as a internal comms person craft the message to help drive the, the, the kind of help rudder the ship behind the scenes. I so appreciate you asking that question. I once had an opportunity to go into an organization and help elevate the manager to be able to be more strategic and help with the succession planning. And we did some great work. And when I left, the work faltered. And when I would come back, they'd get all excited again. Oh, I'm so glad you're here to help me. Let's really move forward with that strategy. And then I would leave again and there would always be an excuse. 
But then there was the other person, the junior person in the organization that I was also supposed to teach and train a few things. But they came to me and said, oh my, I saw how you communicated with that person. Can you teach me? I have a meeting. Can you prep me? The key thing that I want leaders to think about is don't just look at the people with the titles. Don't just look at the nine box or the Pareto of the what we think are the high performers. Look at the people that in function, in their passion, in the way they show up, they are highly aware of their performance and keep asking questions. What can I do better? What do we need to do to get to the next step? Because we are duped by the people that just have the title, that those are the ones we should be grooming. A leader needs to take the time and look at the landscape of all the people in the organization. One, realize Everybody can be a high performer and elevate, but look for those gems, those diamonds in the rough that are passionate, that are hungry and keep asking questions about what can I do? What can I grow? It's not just the high performers. It's anybody in the organization. So that's what we as leaders need to do is look at our entire workforce and see who needs help. Who can we help communicate better? Uh, Because sometimes those ones that entitle seem to be ready don't have the personal awareness. That's the first thing that we need to find in these peoples is the capacity and awareness to grow. And then we can teach them all the things about how to communicate better. You came in, you worked with them, they did well, you left, they fell off, you came back. They did well, but when you leave, so how do you help them to sustain the behavior that you've helped them create or develop? That's a really great question. And it's one of those things, um, given the opportunity, I probably should have had more one-on-ones, but I was not necessarily their direct leader. Uh, I recently found out that person ultimately left the organization. So it was probably not the right fit. But if I had to continue to work with somebody, and there's a point of conflict, a gap, not getting the desired result, difficult conversations all about communication. Don't necessarily assume, oh, they're lazy. One way that I have guided aspiring C-suite leaders when you have that gap, don't sit and fester over, but hit it head on. Start from a framework. One, talk to the person and just find out common ground. What do we both agree to that we need to move the organization forward with this initiative? Yes. By at least establishing common ground where maybe there's a disagreement or a gap, you've at least moved the relationship and the trust forward. Second point, identify the gap and ask the person, do you see the gap in performance? We agreed to get this work done, but since I've been gone, we haven't. Do we agree that that's a gap? And they say, yes. I didn't get the work done. You've moved the conversation, the communication forward. Then three, seek to understand why is there this gap? Because you might not know exactly why they've not been able to perform. There could be conflicting priorities that pull the person away what the plan is. You need to seek to understand the truth about why the gap exists. And only then should you action on and say, oh, I didn't realize that. Let's change the timeline. Can I help you with this? Identify actions that they can do, that they need to take ownership for, and actions that you can do. You've moved the conversation forward again. And so it was a positive experience versus, oh, they, they're not disciplined. They don't care. They're not on the same page. We need to remove those, those perceptions and be able to give people a, a conduit for having a productive communication. Kind of bouncing off something you said a few moments ago when talking about, you know, maybe some of the younger workforce, um, you know, I think a lot of times you you can't just look at the resume, right? You've got to look at the intangibles, you know, that it factor. It's the same thing in sports, right? I mean, you can't just look at the guy who has all the measurables. I mean, are they going to outwork everybody? Uh, and I think that's something that you need to look at when it comes to younger people. But we've spoken on the great resignation numerous times this season on the podcast. And I'm kind of curious from your end, what are you seeing businesses do to retain that young talent and those emerging leaders instead of, you know, so they stay with the company instead of jumping around every two to three years? So you may not like my response, but I have two thoughts on this. One, the great resignation 
was simmering underneath everything. It would have happened eventually, but maybe at a slow burn because we as leaders fail to recognize what are people really looking for in terms of valuable work. And so it just accelerated that and let this be awakening because if not this and the next crisis that comes up, there's going to be a major shift in what how people want to work. So I just wanted to put that out there. It does exist. It's been labeled and profiled, but it was already there just waiting to happen. Now, to your point about what is the uh, model that people should be thinking about. You talk about the young people, gosh darn it, even us older than 40 or 50 years old, we're starting to show up on our resume as job hopping a little bit too, because maybe it's, we are wanting something very strong. Uh, we need to align our values with the values of the company. Once you get that, that millennial, that young professional is going to stick around a little bit, but they are hungry for feedback. They are hungry for knowledge and they want that soul to be fed. And if they're not getting that within the company, it's the company's responsibility, but they're already taking control of their career. I'm not getting it here. I'm going to go where I get it. So think about those are the leaders that are job hopping because they're taking personal accountability for what they want in the world and how they want to contribute. So I want leaders to think differently and always be asking them, what do they need? What do they want? What can they, how can they help them to be successful? I think that's great advice for not only young people, but for people of all generations. And I, I do like how in the past year, year and a half, we've seen people take ownership of that you know, take ownership of their careers, whether they're 24 years old or 55 years old. And I think that's incredibly powerful, especially as we move forward, uh, you know, in the, the post COVID, hopefully world, uh, you know, in, into 22 and 2022 and beyond. But uh, Deb, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the business communicators podcast this week. And you know, we, we do want to give you a time to, uh, you know, uh, let our listeners know where they can find you and uh, hear and see all of the different work that you're doing. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Easiest way to get to everything, Deb, or the Drop-In CEO is my my website, dropinceo.com, D-R-O-P-I-N-C-E-O.com. You can get to my podcast, my blog, uh, the book, The CEO's Compass, Your Guide to Get Back on Track. You can sign up for my newsletter. And I also play on LinkedIn. Look for the Drop-In CEO. I'd love to have a conversation. Lots of content there to help the aspiring CEO. Well, thank you so much, Deb. And of course, if you're listening to this podcast right now on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Play, wherever you listen, just scroll down to the show notes and we'll include all of those links in there. So you can just click, subscribe, follow, all of that. So Deb, thank you so much for joining us on the Business Communicators. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Business Communicators. 